We are in our Overcomer series, and today we're going to be talking about overcoming negativity. Um, who struggled with negativity? I know I have um, from time to time. Sometimes we face it, and uh, we know we're doing it. Sometimes we're doing it, and we don't even know we're doing it. Uh, but I know that it, it can be a real thing, and we're going to try to break that down, understand it from a biblical perspective this morning. But one of the great things, one of the great things about being a follower of Christ is that God calls us to surrender. And in surrender, He does things for us that we cannot do for ourselves. And in surrender, we can find the strength and the power and the ability to overcome many things, including negativity. I'm telling you, God is powerful enough to do that in our lives. And we need to do that. Um, you know, people ask the question, are you a positive person or are you a negative person? Um, you know, sometimes positivity uh, is something we generate in our own strength. And we just choose to say we're positive. Now, we're going to talk about something much deeper than just being positive on the surface. We're going to go much deeper to understand that. But some people are positive, some people are negative, and as it says about some people, they're just positively negative. And so it just kind of depends. But negativity has this ability and power to so drain you emotionally and drain everyone around you that it needs to be addressed. It can tear up your testimony for Christ. It can ruin opportunities for ministry. It can drag other people down. It is very powerful and it is impactful. And like I said, sometimes we realize we're being negative. We do it on purpose. We know exactly what we're doing. Other times, we're doing it, and we don't even realize we're doing it. Um, you know, having a negative attitude or complaining is like bad breath. Um, this is what William Bowen said. He said, it's like bad breath. You notice it when it comes out of somebody else's mouth, but not your own. And how true that can be. Ephesians 4, 29 through 31 says this, do not, that's a command, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths. That's pretty clear, right? But only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Those who are listening to me, I have to ask myself the question, am I benefiting those people or am I being negative to a point that I'm damaging those people? Mark, don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. Only, only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs. Now that's strong, isn't it? That is a verse we should all memorize. Ephesians 4, 29, and then all the way down through 31 is helpful as well. Let me say something about negativity. It has the ability to sneak up on us at any time, in many different ways. It comes in various forms. You can call it complaining. Uh, you can call it slander. You can call it manipulation, lying, disobedience. Many, many other sins can quickly fall in this category that's connected to negativity. Look, it can come when we're doing fine. It can come when life gets hard. In fact, sometimes it can come when we just want to get our way. How many times have we been negative because we just didn't get our way? And through negativity that becomes manipulation, we find a way to get what we want through negativity that is manipulation. This is something we can all fall uh, prey to. Think about this verse in Philippians 2, 14 and following. Listen to what he says. Do everything, that is everything, without complaining or arguing. So that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the word of life. In order that I may boast on the day of Christ, that I did not run or labor for nothing. Paul's really sharing his heart here as a spiritual leader, as a shepherd. And he's saying, look guys, you know, quit complaining Quit arguing. We are in a depraved world, but you're to shine like stars as you hold out this word. And if you're not doing that, it puts me in a position where I feel like everything I've done is to not. There's no good reason for it because we're not being the testimony and the light we're supposed to be. That's what he's saying. And so really my goal 
The desire of my heart today in addressing this subject of negativity is that if there is any measure of it in my life, in your life, and I know if it's not there today, it may come. It may come the moment this service is over, I may be facing something that caused me to be negative. That I want to learn how to overcome it. Here's why. I want to shine like the stars of the universe. And I want to hold out this word of life. And if I can do those two things until Jesus comes for me, look, then I can serve him. But the moment I slide over into negativity, I get into complaining, and I get into arguing, I'm not shining my light like the stars in the universe. And I'm not holding out the word of truth. I'm losing my edge. I'm losing my testimony. I'm losing my influence. And I don't want us to do that. I don't want us to be overcome by negativity. I want us to overcome negativity. And so to do that, so the first comments are simply to say it's a real thing. It is powerful, but we can overcome it in the Lord. I really want to get down and address how you do that. And so overcoming negativity by winning the war in your mind is what I want to talk about. And there are three things we've got to understand from 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5. I want to read it one more time. Follow along as I read it. Because Paul is giving us something here that we all need to understand, and we need to not just understand it, but apply it in our lives. Here's what he says. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Now, we're going to break this down into three parts so that we fully understand what Paul's talking about here, so we can apply this word. And it's so powerful in helping us overcome negativity and literally any sin, but we're focusing on negativity. Now, I want to back up and I want to read uh, verse 1 and 2. This puts it in its context, okay? Because Paul writes here and he says, By the meekness and gentleness of Christ, I appeal to you, I, Paul, who am timid, when face to face with you, but bold went away. I beg you that when I come, I may not have to be as bold as I expect to be towards some people. What he's saying is, this is my personality, but if I come, I will address this because it has to be addressed. And watch what he says. He's going to address some people, if they don't get it together, who think that we live by the standards of this world. As believers, we are called to lift live a different life by a different set of standards, and we engage life differently. And so he's got believers who are living by a worldly standard, fighting, trying to fight spiritual battles in a worldly way. And so what he's going to do to help them understand why it has to be addressed is the verses 3, 4, and 5. And he's saying, yes, we live in the world, but we do not fight like the world does. We don't live by the worldly standards. And so he's helping them understand this. And so for you and I, what we've got to come to an understanding is that it could be that we're failing to be the stars of the universe holding out the word because we're living by a worldly standard and we're trying to fight spiritual battles with worldly weapons and they are worthless. And so we want to break this down and we want to grasp this and understand it. Three things I want us to see from these verses is the battlefield that is defined here, the divine weapons that must be deployed, and then we're going to see the end goal, desire. And if we see these things, we will be able to overcome negativity in our lives. So let's begin with the battlefield defined. You find this in verse 3 and the last part of verse 5. He says, for though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. That's the first thing we need to understand, that there is a war that is waging. This is not something that is made up in Paul's mind. He's not living in a fairy tale world. He's saying, listen, we live in a spiritual wor world, and we are fighting a spiritual war. Some people have defined this or identified it as the invisible war. It is a war that is intense. It is unrelenting. It's constant. It's challenging. Do you understand? Listen, believer, do you understand you are involved in a spiritual war? You've got to grasp that. You've got to grapple with that. You've got to say, okay, if that's real, I accept it. Because that's what the Bible teaches. 
And so where is this war taking place? That's the second question I would raise. Because we're talking about defining the battlefield here. Well, it is the battlefield of your mind. We have so many thoughts that are running through our mind. As I speak to you right now, your mind is racing. Yes, you're hearing what I'm saying, but you're thinking about possibly what I'm saying. You may be thinking about something else. I don't know. Some people can think two or three things all at one time. Anybody in the room like that? Yeah, there's a few people like that. Sometimes I have multiple thoughts running through my mind all at once. I don't know how to control that exactly, but I mean, I don't, I'm just saying I don't know how that happens, but it, it can happen. My point is there's this dynamic in our minds, this internal um, dialogue of conversation that is constantly going on in our minds. We need to understand what that is and why that's happening and what's going on in the midst of it. It is the battlefield of your mind. This is not a physical location. Several years ago, Michelle took me on a trip and uh, we did a history tour. And one of the places she took me was Antietam National Battlefield. It's a famous Civil War battlefield. It's located in Maryland. I'd never been there, never heard of it. She explained it all to me. We got out. We went in the museum. We looked at all that. Then we went out. We walked on the actual battlefield. We saw exactly. She said, this happened here, and this happened over here under this famous bridge down here. And she told me about that battle. And that's an actual battlefield, right? It's physical. We know historically what happened on that battlefield. And so we identify with that. We say, we know what happened right here on this battlefield. That's a physical battlefield. Now, to get us a little closer to an understanding, we know today, which sometimes it's even hard to understand this, but our military fights a cyber war, right? That's ones and zeros, the binary stuff, traveling through cables and airwaves, and it's a war. It's a battlefield with ones and zeros running through the air somehow. Can you understand that? Is that not true? Matt's not, not, yeah, not, we got some people that live in that reality, and it is true. But can you, do you understand that? I don't even understand really how a text message works, but somehow it works, right? Now, that's, that's a battlefield that's a little harder for us to grasp because it's not physical. So you got a physical battlefield. you got a cyber battlefield. Well, let me tell you about this battlefield, if you can grasp those two. This is a mental battlefield that rages in your mind. Do you get that? Do you understand that? It's true. To help you grasp this, you have to come down to the second part of verse 5 where he says this, and we take captive every what? Thought. That word right there, the word thought, is a key word to help us understand and define the battlefield that it is in our mind. Now, there's some believers who are still trying to figure this out, that we're even in a war a spiritual war. There are others who understand it, but they haven't figured out how to fight the battle and win the battle. They just get frustrated in the midst of it and become, uh, you know, just defeated constantly in the midst of it. But today we're going to unpack this so we can understand how to win the war of our minds. We cannot use human weapons. We must fight this spiritual battle with spiritual weapons. Listen, the reason this is so important to the enemy, Satan, is he knows that if he can capture your mind, he captures your life. And, and that's why this is so important. We know this. People come in and they say, well, you know, maybe a communistic society wants to come in and take us over. They take over our minds. They're going to get the next generation. They're going to capture their mind. And if they can capture their mind, they capture their life. And if you get somebody to think a certain way, then they'll act a certain way, right? Right? That's the same thing that is true that goes on spiritually. Satan wants to capture the mind. That's why we've got to guard our minds. That's why we've got to fight for the protection of our minds. And we've got to understand this and learn how to protect, guard, renew our minds and live with God's perspective. I love Romans 12 too because here's what it says. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of the world, but be... I love this word, transformed by the renewing of your mind. Do you know how to transform your mind to renew it by God's word? If not, you must understand how to do that. He says, then you'll be able to test and approve God's will, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Please also understand and remember that all sin begins in the mind. The Bible's very clear on that. Something is offered to us, we consider it this 
all takes place in the mind, all the way back to Adam and Eve, all the way through. The sin of David, it all took place in his mind first. People commit the sin in their mind, then the actions are carried out. The mind is the battlefield, is what I would simply want to say first and foremost. The battlefield defines our minds. The second thing I want you to see is the divine weapons that we can deploy. This is mentioned to us in verses 4 and first part of 5. The weapons we what? Sit around with? No. The weapons we do what with? We fight with weapons, right? This is a war, right? And and, and these weapons, they're not the kind of weapons the world uses. On the contrary, the weapons he's given us, they have divine power. They demolish things. They demolish strongholds, arguments, pretensions that set themselves up against the knowledge of God. There is so much right here. First, we see that there are weapons of the world. Did you know the world has weapons? And see, this is where Paul was trying to get the church at Corinth to understand. Listen, you are fighting with worldly weapons. You're living by the standard of the world, and I'm coming, and I'm going to have to address it if you don't get it straight. And he said, look, before I get there, let me just review this with you. We don't live that way. We don't fight that way. We're in a spiritual war. But the weapons of the world are things like this. They fight with things like this, prestige, power, politics, position, heritage, connections, money, manipulation, education, slander, and any sinful practice that will advance a person's selfish desires. That's the weapons of the world. You say, how do you know that? Because Paul talks about those weapons in Philippians 3, 4 through 8, and he said, you know what? When I came to know Christ, I considered every bit of that trash. It's rubbish. It's worthless. It's worthless. I'm not living like that anymore. I'm not living off my personal resume, my heritage, my abilities, my drive, whatever else I can come up with that's based on me. I'm telling you, it's all trash compared to knowing Christ crucified. See, the world works off these weapons, not you and I. We're we're, we're to live a different way. And Paul said these weapons are worthless because he wasn't fighting against flesh and blood. He's not fighting against another human being, although another human being may be an instrument of the enemy. What he realizes is there's a bigger battle going on. It's with Satan and his demonic powers that are out to destroy us. So now you're really getting out there, Mark. No, I'm just saying what the Bible teaches. There's a spiritual war that takes place. There's something going on that oftentimes is called the invisible war because we can't see it, but it's happening in our minds. Somebody gets on TV and they talk about how, the, this, how Satan caused them to go and take somebody else's life, to commit murder. And we go, how could that happen? How could they do that? Well, there's a spiritual war going on. Satan's convincing people to do certain things. It's a war in the mind. It's a war for the life. It's a war for the soul. It's a spiritual battle. And if we take the weapons of the world like the people in Corinth were doing, and we try to fight a spiritual battle with worldly weapons, that'd be like asking a Navy SEAL to go into battle with a water gun. It's worthless. It's worthless. And so here's what I'm trying to get you to grasp is, if I have thoughts going on in my mind that are battlefield thoughts, the enemy's coming at me, and I try to combat those things with prestige, with power, with money, with philosophy, with whatever else I want to come up with to try to put those things in perspective, it's worthless. It's like a water gun going into battle. It's not going to accomplish anything. Paul's saying you're losing the battle because you don't know how to fight with what God's given us. (laughs) Well, what did he give us? What are these weapons? When you go to Ephesians 6, 17, and 18, you understand clearly from the writing of God's Word, as Paul wrote to the Ephesian church, that our weapons are prayer and the Word of God. Very simple. And these weapons, he says, guess what they have? Divine power. It means that God's given them and God works through them. They are weapons empowered by God. They are supercharged spiritually weapons because God has given them and God uses them. And when you take those weapons and you submit and surrender to God and in those weapons you have the ability As it says over in James, you submit to God, resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. 
Matthew 4, what did, what did Jesus do? He took the Word of God, and he fought this battle with Satan who came to tempt him, and he put everything in perspective. This is a battlefield of the mind where the Word of God and prayer are the divine weapons that take care of the enemy when he comes at us. It's not a toy. It's not just this thing we carry around, and it looks good, and we look spiritual because we're carrying a Bible. Let me just tell you something. Those days are over. And people may try to do that. This Bible only comes alive when we take it, surrender to it, live by the truth of it, and we apply it. We apply it. Then it becomes powerful because it, is, it has divine power. What kind of power, you say? I'll tell you the kind, the kind that can demolish. It demolishes strongholds, arguments, and pretensions. Let's talk about those for a second. What's the stronghold mean? It means to captivate the mind with things that are not true. So things that come in your mind that are not true, where do those come from? Do they come from God? Is God going to flood your mind with things that are not true? No. The enemy floods your mind. Now the flesh is still active in us, even as believers. The old nature is still there. He can still appeal to us as believers to bring us down. And he brings non-truths in. They're strongholds. He wants to capture your mind. They may come through doctrine, philosophy, ways of life, trends, negativity, worry, fear, guilt, resentment, insecurity. All of them work. Whichever one he thinks will work best on you is the one that he uses. Anything, anything that he can offer to replace the truth of God. And it has the ability, literally, to get a hold of your mind, convince you that the non-truth is the way to live. Now, parents, that ought to scare you to death that your children have to function in that reality. <laughs> but it's true. I'm sorry that it's like that. I wish it wasn't, but that's the world we live in. They take their phone. Here, I got my phone right here. They take their phone. They open it up, and literally the whole world is is coming at their mind. I'm just telling you. And you don't have control of that. The one thing you do have control of is to teach them how to guard their mind, how to do this battlefield warfare in their mind as these things come. Because they're coming. I'm telling you, they're coming. And what the world says is, listen, it's okay to go out and live a certain way. That's okay, everybody's doing it. That sounds very innocent, right? That doesn't sound like machine gun fire, does it? But that's how the enemy works. It's just kind of a subtle suggestion. It's kind of a luring of the flesh. Hey, consider these things. And as you consider them, what you don't realize is it's like taking a lock and just locking it down on your mind, like just locking it. And then, then that's a stronghold on the mind. So then you lock into that thinking and you go, that is true, when in reality, it's not true. You call a non-truth truth by living by it because it's got a stronghold on your mind. You've believed a lie. That's how the enemy works. You believe that's okay, or, or that's right, or whatever it is. But he's worked on you in such a way, it, it grasps a hold of your mind, convinces you it's true when it's not. That's a stronghold. So what do you do with that? you got to demolish it. you got to take a hammer to it, man, and just demolish that thing. Because that's what the weapons that have divine power have the ability to do through the Word of God and prayer. You take that thought and you demolish it. I mean, you demolish it, right? But you can, not only the stronghold, but you can demolish the arguments. If the suggestions that become strongholds in your life aren't enough, he'll argue with you. He'll argue. A reasoning, reasoning that is based on non-truth. So you push back a little bit. See, Jesus faced this in Matthew chapter 4. He said no to one thing and quoted Scripture, and then Satan comes back. He says, okay, you quote Scripture, I'll, I'll quote Scripture, but he quoted out of context. See, it's a, it's a form of argumentation. It's a, okay, let's argue about this, and I'm going to convince you. See, some people, that's the struggle. Young people or whoever, whoever we are, we're struggling in our minds with this, and it's a battle. It's a back and forth. It's an argument, and when the argument comes from the enemy, what do you do? You demolish. You put the hammer down on it. And you say, no, 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 that's a lie. The truth is this, from God's Word and through prayer, I'm telling you in my mind, that's wrong. 
I will not accept it. So you got the strongholds, then you got the arguments, and then the pretension. The best to understand this is simply that this is false, bold, arrogant thoughts or claims that come. It's almost like there's a ratcheting up in the arrogance of, no, this is true kind of thing. But you've got to demolish that as well. Oh, I don't know. It was about four or five weeks ago, six weeks ago. I can't remember the exact time. But I remember the details very clearly. I was lying in bed, and it was later in the evening, and I heard Hannah say from the den, Dad. I said, yeah. She said, there's a roach in here. I said, well, kill it. I'm not getting out of bed to kill a roach. I'm tired, you know. So that's what she did. She killed the roach. And I thought all was said and done and good, and, and I assume it was. Well, the next morning I got up, I went in the den, and I promise you it looked like somebody got murdered. I mean, there was blood all over the wall. That roach was splattered up, down, around on the carpet. It was, I mean, legit. It looked like she took a nuclear bomb to that little roach and blew him up. It was probably a bigger roach because of all the carnage that was everywhere. And so I said, when she woke up, I said, Hannah, what in the world? You demolished that guy. She goes, oh, yeah, Dad. I went and got your big hiking boot, and I put it on him. And she did. She got the biggest shoe she could find, my hiking boots, and she got one of those boys, and she went down on him, and she demolished that roach. I mean, demolished him. I'm telling you, until you learn how, by the Word of God and prayer, to demolish, I mean, destroy, annihilate these these strongholds, these arguments, these pretensions that come into your mind, you're going to be susceptible to the enemy taking you down. I'm just telling you. I wish somebody would explain this to me back in high school. Because listen, right now, you're thinking things in your mind. Is he, what he's saying true or not true? The enemy may be even whispering to you, ah, don't worry about that. Oh, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Let me tell you, that is not the voice of God. That is the voice of the enemy. This is something, this is the battlefield in your mind. This is all connected to us being negative or complaining or any kind of sin. We, you say, okay, take the boot, destroy the roach. Why should we do that? Why should we demolish the strongholds, the arguments, and the pretensions? Well, what's the Bible saying? Because... They set themselves up against what? The knowledge of God. See, if Satan can win people's minds, he wins their lives. It's the battle we have going on in our communities, in our churches, in our nation. It is a battle for the mind. What's true and what's not true? What's acceptable what's not acceptable? What's non-truth? What's truth? This is a battle of the mind. It's a spiritual battle. We've got to understand this. So the battlefield's been defined. The divine weapons deployed, the Word of God in prayer, over these strongholds, over these arguments and these pretensions. Yes, we can win so that the Word of God is not taken down. But watch what we've got to do. The end goal desired is the second part of verse 5. Here it is, point number 3. That we have to take captive every thought, that's every thought, and make it obedient to Christ. That's your job and mine. The end goal is every thought I have is obedient to Christ. That's submission. Starting in the mind. The Greek word here for take captive, it means to, uh, to control, to conquer, to bring to submission. Con to control, conquer, bring to submission. Okay? That's what take captive means. But when you also look at the word obedient here, they're both used in this context, very similar. It means to bring into submission, to bring under control. So we've got to take captive and make obedient every thought to Christ. And then we have the ability to win in our minds. See, it's a spiritual work. Anybody ever teach you that's the spiritual work that goes on in your mind? When you get up in the mornings and you can't find purpose, and the enemy says, oh, your life's not worth living. Oh, really? Jesus said that um, the enemy came to steal, kill, and destroy, but I've come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. You know how many times I've quoted that scripture when Satan put that thought in my mind? 
God's given me abundant life here and eternal life to come. I don't believe that. Guess what just happened? I entered the battlefield. The waging spiritual war where Satan wanted to make a suggestion to discourage me, to keep me from fulfilling the will of God. In that very simple moment like that. You don't think that's real? Some people get to the point that they believe the lie that their life's not worth anything and they take it. Then we go, oh man, look how serious that is. That must have been spiritual. No, it was just as spiritual, you know, the five years prior where the thoughts began to start as it was five years down the line where a person took their life and everything in between was the approach of Satan to destroy the life. It's a battlefield in your mind. How do you win? You win with the word of God and prayer. You take every thought captive. You make it submissive. You bring it under control. So look, there's four ways to win in this war in your mind. These are very practical. I want to give these to you. It kind of culminates everything that we've been talking about, and I want you to write these down. The four ways to win, if you believe anything I've said is true, and it is, I hope that you will believe it, you'll write these down. The first thing I want to say to you is you must realize that not everything you think is from God. Not everything you think is from God. Satan loves to offer non-true suggestions to the mind so that our sin nature is naturally drawn to those non-truths. But you can't trust your mind. 1 Timothy 6 says it's depraved. Romans 8, 7 tells us it's sinful. 2 Corinthians 3, 14 says we can have a dull mind. In 2 Corinthians 4, 4, we are blinded by our minds. In 2 Timothy 3, 8, it says we have a corrupt mind. Did you know that your mind has been broken from the beginning because it's been tainted by sin? You can't trust your mind. And not everything that comes in your mind is from God. And so we've got to understand that. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things, desperately wicked or sick. Who can understand it? May I say to you, there's a very complicated thing that's going on up here in your mind all the time. And it is very spiritual. Is that too far out there for you? Let me just tell you, it's real. Don't let your mind lie to you. Don't be deceived by your mind. So the first thing I simply want to say to you is don't realize or realize that not everything you think is from God. The second thing you do so you can determine what is from God and what is not is that you've got to filter everything you think. That is... Your responsibility and mine to control what is going on in my mind. I I can't control what's going on in your mind. I don't know what you're thinking. Here's David sitting up. I don't know what you're thinking. I really don't. How can I? I can't. That's that's between you and God and what's going on. That's your responsibility. Like, you don't know what I'm thinking, even though I'm sitting here preaching, right? See, that's what's going on in my mind, and I'm responsible for that. We're all responsible for this work of this spiritual warfare that takes place in our minds. So we got to learn to filter it. Two ways to do that. One of the great places that teaches us how to do that is Philippians 4. Right? Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, what does it do? It guards your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. The only place you're guarded, the only place you're protected is in Christ. And the only way you get there is through prayer, surrendering it all, thanking him for it, letting him do his work. He does something nobody else can do for you. He gives you a peace that surpasses all understanding. And when that comes, it guards and it protects your mind in Christ Jesus. Prayer guards. Say it any way you want to say but I'm telling you, when you pray, you really pray, you surrender to God, he's doing something for you you cannot do yourself, and that's the beautiful part of being a believer. The second thing you do to filter everything that comes in your mind is you've got to think about certain things. You've got to dwell in praise. Look at what he says. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever's honorable, whatever's just, whatever's pure, whatever's lovely, Whatever is commendable, if there is anything excellent, anything that is praiseworthy or worthy of praise, here it is, think about these things. Pray and think. Pray to God. Think about His Word. Think about God. There's something powerful in prayer and praise that takes care of negativity. Um, 
Rick Warren, I thought these comments were interesting. I want to read these to you. This is his take on this uh, part of this. He says, notice that he says to pray about everything. If you were to pray as much as you worry, you would have a lot less to worry about. Don't worry about anything, but pray about everything. This kind of prayer is like a, a running conversation, which means you are not on your knees. We don't close our eyes. I have trained myself to do this. I talk to God all the time. I'm talking to Him while I'm writing to you. You can develop a two-track mind. Now, the reason I'm re reading that to you is because there is the ability to pray, as the Bible says, without ceasing. It is this keeping of this constant connection with God in prayer, in your mind. Remember I said that some people can do two or three things in their mind? One of the things I've learned to do is to pray all the time, to keep that open channel with God, to, to, to talk to Him constantly. I may be talking to you while I'm praying to God, I promise you, many times. And we've got to learn to do that. And so you pray, and you dwell on the Scripture. And these are your divine, listen, these are your divine, these are your weapons that have divine power to demolish. And if I'm praying, and the Holy Spirit's equipping me with truth, at the moment you speak a lie to me, I can put that into perspective, and I can speak to it if God allows me to, and say, no, that's not right. Let's think about it like this. Or no, I'm not comfortable with that. How do you do that? You've got to learn to pray at all times. Have a two-track mind. So you filter everything through prayer and thinking. And then thirdly, I would say this to you. Fill your mental reservoir with truth. If you don't know God's Word, you don't have anything to battle with. It's the weapons, one of the weapons. Prayer and His Word. But if you don't know the Word, you can't. It's like saying, I'm going to go into war, but I left my gun back here. You've got to have the Word. Jesus, in Matthew 4, just go read it. Just see how he did it. He was our example. Every time he spoke the Word, it's how he put things in perspective. When he dealt with the enemy. He used the Word. So you can resist for a moment. But if you don't resist, remove it, and replace it with truth, it just keeps coming back. I think in Colossians 3, 15 through 17, this kind of this first part of verse 16 I love. He says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts since as members of one body you were called to peace and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. That means have a deep, full reservoir of mental truth. Then you're getting ready. You, you've got something. There's more to you than just your opinion. It's God's Word. So fill your mental reservoir with truth. That's why you should meditate on, memorize God's Word. This is not just something we ask people to do because it sounds spiritual. It's the need that you have to win in the war of your mind. The fourth thing I'd give you is this. Identify your triggers and your tap roots. What in the world are you talking about? Let me tell you what your triggers and your tap roots are. Your triggers are those things that lure and push you into sin. Um, it's what some people call the tipping point. It's that, you know, you know, a parent is stressed out and the kid comes and they say one thing or they do one thing and the parent just, you know, they pull the trigger. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's... Um, the people that switch over into road rage for apparently no reason. Somebody touched on a trigger in their life, right? You've seen that. You've experienced it. You know what I'm talking about? So there are certain triggers that you've got to identify. What are the triggers in your life? If you know what those are, then you learn to stay away from them. But what I want to say about triggers are those are just surface things that are touching on deeper things. You take a person with road rage, we say, well, something just set them off. You know, maybe somebody cut them off on the road accidentally. That just sets them off. But that's not really why they're upset, right? You get that? So the, the tap root is getting down, doing the deeper work of unresolved sin issues in our life. There are root issues of sin. So the person cuts them off. There's your trigger. 
but why did this person go so crazy? Now you got to peel back the layers and get down to what's really going on in their heart and in their life. There's a tap root. And the same is true for you and for me. What is that? you got to know that. See, if you can identify that, then you can do this spiritual work. Know your triggers. Determine your tap roots. Okay? Um, so if something's setting you off, there's a reason for it. Understand what that reason is. Dig down deep into God's Word and get victory over whatever that is. It may be something out of your childhood. It could be an experience. It could be fear. It could be, it could be a lot of things. But God can show you, and by His Word, put that in perspective. So when you get the taproot taken care of, the trigger goes away. Too many people live up here and try to uh, massage the triggers. Oh, I'm just not going to let that happen to me again. And oh, you know, this and that. You've got to go past the trigger down to the taproot so then the trigger no longer exists. Does that make any sense? And the way you deal with both the trigger and the taproot is you've got to know your truth reservoir. That means you've got to know verses that address your trigger. Then you've got to know verses that address your taproot. And, all, and that's very basic and it's very quick. But what I'm trying to say to you, all of it is, whether it's the trigger or the taproot, you're getting God's perspective on whatever it is in your life that you need to get perspective on. And whatever that is, and I don't know how this works, but Satan knows it, and he comes and he offers a lie when God says, here's the truth. Which one are you going to choose? And that's what's going on in the mind. But if you can do these things, know the trigger, the tap root, the truth reservoir, you're ready to win in your mind. And when you win in your mind, you will become an encourager, not a complainer. You will be a victor, not a victim. You will be wise, not unwise with the words and the attitudes of your life. When we talked about last week or so uh, in talking about Israel and how they came against Moses, they're known as complainers and grumblers. See, they grumbled about Moses. They grumbled about the food. They grumbled about the water. They grumbled about the wilderness. They wanted the past. They hated the present. They could see no future worth living for. And so they grumbled. But here's what you got to understand. Moses' name was put in there. But ultimately, they were not grumbling against Moses. They were grumbling against God. And when you and I get negative, Ultimately, what we're negative about is not whatever we're, the Moses we're putting up there. We're really, ultimately, as a believer, we're, we're grumbling, being negative against God. These grumblers, they're gripers. It's never good enough. Grumblers are grumpy. It's always bad. Grumblers are gloomy. It will always fail. You show a grumbler a glass of water and ask if it is half full or half empty, they will say, I don't know, but the water is probably polluted. My desire is that we shine like stars in the universe as we hold out the word of life for the glory of God. We can overcome any and all negativity. Let's go to the Lord in prayer.